great thing about working uh, with Reed is not just meeting all these wonderful people within the project and getting to, to know all this te technical uh, stuff and things, but also every time you, you step into a room and go into a congress, you don't know what is expecting you, because as soon as you start talking about automatic text recognition or, or, st or layout analysis, there are people coming to you with ideas what could be done with, with their material. So it's really like it's every day you're at the beginning of, of a new project and you have no idea that's the beginning of a, of a new project. And this is also a bit the idea of, uh, of this, se this session this morning, so that you're getting ideas what people are doing with, with transcribers, with the, the tools of read, and in order to start thinking about what can be done better and how the, the scholarly researchers can proceed. So, without further ado, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce... Um, sorry, I need... Uh, Deborah Cornell, your, your CV is so long, uh, I, I need my laptop with me. <laughs> <laughs> she studied at uh, University of North Texas, worked at UCLA, ChipChat Media, which is a great page to, to visit, and the Art Institute of um, California. And since 2015, she, she's the head of digital services, so she's in the middle of the age, uh, head of the digital services at William and Mary Libraries. And she's going to talk about the Georgian papers. A project that uses extensively transcribers. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Good morning. The Georgian Papers Program is a partnership between the Royal Collection Trust, which is basically the umbrella institution or organization for the British Royal Archives, um, King's College London, and is joined by the primary U.S. United States partners, the Omaha Hunter Institute of Early American History and Culture and the um, educational institution William and Mary, both based in Virginia. Um, the goal of the project, or the hopes of the project, is to transform through digitization, metadata, transcription, and academic engagement the understanding of 18th century North America and Georgian Britain and its monarchy at a time of profound cultural, political, economic, and social change which created the modern nation. The partnership between the U.S., and Britain is largely because the Georgian monarchy was, King George III was king of England during the American Revolution. We gained our independence from Britain. So there's a good area of study on both sides of the Atlantic in this area. By engagement, it's not just a digitization and metadata or transcription project. They have people at King's College London and at William and Mary trying to build um, course programming around it. They are actively doing fellowships where people go in and investigate with the Royal Archives and then produce um, symposiums and papers out of that. So what you'll see here is a top link is actually about the Georgian Papers Program. The middle link is the Royal Collection site where they're actually publishing the digitized material and their collection aids. So you'll find PDFs of what they have digitized already. And the bottom um, link is actually the crowdsourcing transcription site that William and Mary is building and will hopefully have available by the end of 2017. So William and Mary Libraries at William and Mary is the project lead for the transcription portion of the project. The content of the papers is approximately 350,000 pages or images covering letters, diaries, ledgers, account books, menus, recipes, writing and receipts. Um, the content is a range of different hands or done by different individuals and the quality or penmanship is quite varied. Um, given the amount of the content we have, um, us along with King's College thought it would be a great opportunity to explore transcribus as a way to get this um, transcription done along with crowdsourced transcription which we are um, constructing an Omeka plus MediaWiki site to handle and hopefully have done by the end of 2017. Um, so King's College and us put forth Transcribus as a tool for the program and we began using it a year ago. So this is an example of some of the, I would say the average documents we have. We do have a good number in secretaries or clerks hands which is easily read. We also have documents that are just horrors to look at because they're highly marked out. Um, scribed like that. So the vast majority of what we've seen so far is this type of quality. So what we've been using transcribers for is sort of the Georgian Papers transcription philosophy is to create diplomatic transcriptions, basically capturing faithfully the text, but not concerned with sort of the structure, so no heavy TEI markup or not. 
the end product is really being for a baseline or a raw transcription, um, much like the Bentham project. Um, and then these um, raw transcriptions will be made available along with the digital record and the images at some point. Um, but they'll also be used, um, the transcription is at King's, um, King's Digital Lab and King's College will do more metadata analysis or data analysis to reach um, more subject terms, name authorities, um, sort of markup of places, events to see what kind of other stuff they can do. But it's also make it available for people doing digital humanities who want to do um, text analysis and that type of stuff. For So what we've been using it for is the transcription, the initial content we got, because the Royal Archives is doing the scanning, the initial metadata, and then they send us images and the metadata. And it's a phased project. So the initial content we got were the George George III's essays, which was quite, some in good hands, some in horrific hand, lots of markup and um, crossed out. So we got about um, 3,500 pages transcribed. We use student transcribers. We pay them to come in and do transcription. And we've achieved one, um, we'll call it the Georgia Third model, which is about, I think it's more than like 16% error rate. But we've also applied the Bentham, the English M1 model to it, and we come out with a 5% error rate, which we find very encouraging knowing that the content we fed in was not as high quality as it, it could have been. It was quite a range. So I think going forward, we now know to put the really poor quality content to the crowdsourcing and use the higher quality content for transcribus. So what we're looking to do in 2018 is to begin more transcription and start testing out the text-to-image matching and hopefully build up improving the George III model and still continuing with playing with the Bentham model to see if we can either... I think to, Tobias you know, recommended maybe combine the models to see what that can do if it can enrich... Um, to that, so that might be since they basically cover the same sort of time period, 18th, 19th century, it might be a good universal model to work on for English hand. Um, but one area, let me see, we're keenly interested in exploring in the, the first year, analyzing all the um, content as it's coming out, is we have a quite large portion of the Georgian papers um, are ledger books or tabular data being anything from household establishment list, menus or, um, I'm kind of forgot there, the accounting of what the Royal House of Pool bought, just a daily accounting of different households, and sort of receipts, bills, which I know Transcribus is just starting to get in. But we're hoping to work on this with our computer science at William & Mary. We found one faculty and a PH student that is interested in doing machine learning data analysis. So we're hoping right now, literally two weeks ago, they started looking at Transcribus and our content to see if they would be a good project for them for tabular layout. I'm trying to think. We've also explored the OCR capabilities of Transcribus from some previously tra um, transcribed letters that were printed in the early, um, I think it was like 1920s. Um, and it's done really well with that, so we're trying to do OCR to capture the data to then match up to the manuscript images and see if it can train the model better. What we're pursuing now is, besides carrying on with doing transcribus with our um, building our geo model or working with the Bentham model, is hopefully going for um, funding proposals within the U.S. National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting maybe transcribus workshops. There's a couple other institutions in the U.S. that are, that are playing around with it but also supporting the Georgian Papers transcription and hopefully funding for getting more computer science people interested in it to help us along with the communities. So many thanks. That gives you enough time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thanks. Thank you also for crossing the ocean for coming. Oh, no, business. thanks for inviting me. <laughs> questions? I think we have always like two or three minutes for questions so that you really can talk about and on your mind. How many people are working actually on the project? You have such a distributed structure. On the prize. So just on the transcription or the entire? The entire project. We have, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
two, three, four, five. So on the transcription portion, currently have seven people. Um, that would be me as staff to graduate, history graduate students. I think I have four undergraduate transcribers. And then if the computer science gets interested in that. That's just on the transcription side. Then we have the Omohundro Institute has um, one lead for the project. They have one academic lead for the campus, and then they have numerous um, fellows and graduates. And then you have King's College, or King's Digital Lab, which has a metadata analysis, and their entire lab is actually um, charged with building the ultimate platform for this. So a platform that can hold the transcription, the images, the enriched metadata, but also give a portal for academics to actually manipulate and work with the product. So you have four or five people there. And then you have the academic side of King's College, which is you have the project lead, um, an academic lead, and then anybody else who's interested in the project comes in too. And then you have the Royal Archives staff, which is you have the project <laughs> lead. Um, they've hired a digitization um, Per specialist for the project, which is basically a five-year position. Um, they've hired two cataloger metadata people, plus you have the normal catalogers um, as part of the Royal Archives. So the, the part of this collection is it's never been described or cataloged before, so they are going back to step one to totally rearrange. So that's just the committed members. So there's fellows and other partners that change in and out. We have faculty members who are interested in doing crowdsourcing, so trying to build their academic courses around doing the transcription, or we have lots of students who are interested in going into archives, libraries, um, but also a lot of students who are just interested in learning foreign language on historical documents or reading historical documents, so they'll come in and learn how to do transcription. So it's a great way for that. Thanks for the question. Anything else? Other questions? So thanks again. No, thank we'll you. A bit of bigger more. <laughs> Next up is uh, Karl Tölln from the Georg August University in uh, Göttingen. She's a fellow medievalist, which is also always a pleasure. And while I'm trying to set up your presentation, uh, I need to say that uh, your model for Inconobia is one of my favorite ones because it really shows first what we can do with old prints and uh, second how to work with uh, lots and lots of abbreviations. And I think, I hope you're going to talk about this. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm currently working on uh, researching 15th century instructions for liturgical singing. And I will first describe my motivation of working with transcribus, then present the sources, the main print source, and the additional manuscript sources, and then go into detail concerning my work in process with transcribus. When I first read about transcribus, I was trying to look up passages concerning singing in the 16.5 edition of the writings of Johannes Tritemius. To handle the more than 1,200 pages of the edition, I made use of the OCR of a freeware PDF viewer. The result, as you can see, was quite garbled, and what you see here is one of the better parts. But it enabled me to look up words like Falmum for Psalmum, or Mufika for Musica, or Cantare. In spite of the unreliable OCR result, I enjoyed having the scanned images of the or original printed hand, and I wish to have more and earlier sources available in this way. Then I started preparing an edition of the Liber Ordinarius of the Bursfelde Congregation, and I wanted to make available searchable PDF files of the sources. I thought of an easy way to connect my transcription with the scanned images and remembered reading about transcribers and that it would be able to do this. The main interest for me at this point was to get searchable PDF files, that my transcription would provide the HTR engine with training material was a nice side effect. Before I describe the transcribing process, let me first characterize the sources. The central source is an incunable print 
the Ordinarius Divinorum Negrorum Sancti Benedicti de Observantia Bosfellensi, printed Marienthal 1474-75, consisting of 183 pages, and that is the one that is transcribed in full and that will be presented here. Additionally, there are at least 27 manuscript sources in different types and writing. Some seem to be more or less complete, some are only short excerpts, and some are not in Latin, but in German. Characteristic for the incunable print is its highly abbreviated writing style. At a rough guess, about 80% of the words are abbreviated. <coughs> Typical kinds of abbreviations are special characters that replace uh, a whole word, like et, you see it down there, or replace uh, specific sequences of letters, like us, the first word means prologus, rum or rem, here you have divino rum, the last letter is rum, con or cum, this word means congruum, Pro, the word means prosus or pre, representetur, or tur, foveatur, the last letter means tur. There can be a stroke above a word indicating a missing letter uh, N or M, as here in uh, the first word you see here is bursfeldensi, and the second one means tympano. And then there are, of course, the real abbreviations I've just selected. Divinorum, Benedicti, and Dominum. There are much more, but only to see what kinds of abbreviations are used. A usual OCR process wouldn't be able to cope with this, even if it were able to read the single letters. So there wasn't a choice but to manually transcribe the text. To facilitate the reading of the abbreviations, an early modern print version of the text was transcribed first. This transcription was then adjusted to the earlier print version. The classical Latin of the later print was altered to the medieval Latin of the earlier print by find and replace, especially A E to E, and with CO, the T was replaced with C, and uh, some other frequently occurring words were also changed with uh, find and replace. And then I adapted the line breaks for every page, and this can be done in uh, every text editor. Then the page layout had to be marked in the graphic interface of Transcribus, and at first I had to mark not only the text regions but also all the lines. After much of the work was already done, I discovered that an automatic detection of the lines was now possible. Now, the adjusted text can be copied into the text editor of Transcribus. Proofreading is necessary to eliminate the difference between the early and the later text version, as well as my own transcribing errors. It was facilitated by the highlighting of the matching lines in the graphic editor and the text editor, as you see it over there. After all the pages were edited in this way, the work was exported in the different formats supported by, uh, by Transcribus, among others, the searchable PDF files I wanted to have. So my workflow in detail, upload of the scanned images, scanning the classical, changing the classical Latin into medieval Latin, preparing five to ten images with text regions and lines, adapting the line breaks of one page, copying the adjusted text into the transcriber's text editor, proofreading, and repeat task three or four to six, until more than 100 pages are transcribed. The method described here is quick and easy for sources where you already have the text. For example, if you already transcribed a similar version. So, as I was mainly interested in getting searchable PDF files and already had the text, it was the method of my choice. The method of dealing with abbreviations recommended by the transcribers team was different. Abbreviated words should be transcribed literally, possibly using special characters for the abbreviation signs, then tagging the abbreviations and offering the expansion as an attribute. The transcribers team was so kind as to offer to redo the transcription of the incunable in this method themselves, using my already transcribed text as model. 
I think the following part could be, could be better described by Gerhard Mühlberger or one of, his tech, uh, of the technical staff. I will explain it as good as I understood it myself. The transcribers team first used their own transcription method as training material for the HTR engine, but was not really satisfied with the outcome. They then used my quick and dirty transcription as training material and found that the en engine was able to cope with the abbreviations, at least with more frequent ones. I present you a part of the automatic transcription of one of the pages. If you are familiar with this kind of sources, you see that not only the signal letters are read correctly, but also most abbreviations are expanded properly. Errors occur at three different kinds of difficulties. First, uppercase letters. Those are not so frequent in the text, so there might not have been enough training material. Additionally, the uppercase letters are in this source, in most cases, marked by a red stroke, which might alter the appearance enough to make the recognition difficult for the HTR engine. You see here the uppercase letter R, R falsely identified as an F. Some of the abbreviations are incorrectly expanded that may be those that have been represented in the training material less frequently or are ambiguous concerning the abbreviation signs, but I have no, found no fitting example on this page which uh, shows how good it is. For some words, the abbreviations are consisting of nothing more than one or two letters and can only be read if you know the incipit of the chant or the prayer. Here you see paternoster and undem dominum. Seen as a whole, for me the effects of working with transcribers have been such that I am planning and already have started to use it for the rest of the sources as far as they are available for scanning. I appreciate the discipline it gives to the transcribing process as well as the searchable PDF files it produces and I am looking forward on seeing the next improvements of the HTR engine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, have you tried to build a model when you already uh, made the abbreviations into the normal words, or did you only start building a model after you tagged them as an abbreviation and then what it truly meant in an attribute? And if so, what did work better? As for the model, you have to ask someone else because I only made the transcription and then had uh, email contact to Gerd Mühlberger and um, he, answered my, um, he answered me with what I just uh, told you. Yes, uh, we did uh, a model and we were surprised that it uh, didn't uh, bring the results we expected because we uh, spent a lot of work into actually um, transcribing the special characters. But uh, there are some special characters actually included. Mm -hmm. Um, might also be a case of frequency, so not enough training data because the character set is larger. On the other hand, it's funny that it learns the abbreviations uh, so nicely. So, um, yeah, we, I, I don't have a proper answer. I sometimes discussed it with the team from Rostock. Um, you surely have a proper answer. <laughs> Do we understand it? Normally, the training signals of the transcription should be approximately the number of characters should be matched to the number of characters in the image. So you have for example the abbreviation DR for doctor and you transcribe this doctor, there's some limitation in our software so you cannot read arbitrarily long expansion of abbreviations. So mm. one or two character it is it shows that it's possible. Hmm. It was also for us a surprise that it works, <laughs> and I still do not like that. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I think to your question, when you really um, have a transcription which better fits to the image, then I would expect that that would even be better. So please transcribe what you see, and it, it works. Good for you, but it's yeah. <laughs> We have some problems. <laughs> okay, other questions <laughs> regarding abbreviations or inconobula. Did you say something about the amount of training data you provided? How many pages for the, this inconobula? 
Um, I contacted Gerhard Mühlberger when I was over 100 pages. I don't know the exact amount. And I, I, I worked uh, farther because I, I just needed a working text. So I just uh, transcribed and transcribed and transcribed and transcribed until I was ready. I don't know at which point uh, they started to train uh, the model. Okay. It's recorded in the model, so we should I'm not sure if this is mainly a question for you or more a question on abbreviations generally, but does the model actually, if you expand the abbreviations out and write the full text, that, is that in any way, uh, does that if affect the model itself or does the model only look at the, the words that are transcribed on the page um, when, it, when you train it? So as in, does it make a difference if you go through and expand out all your abbreviations? Or if all you want is a text that has the abbreviations in it, to a literal transcription, will it be fine if you just transcribe exactly as it is? So you mean abbreviating by tagging? As in, does that have any effect on the model? So far, taking has no, um, does not influence the uh, modern because we just ignore any markup. Okay. I'm thinking about something that Mühlberger said yesterday. Uh, he said uh, in keyword spotting, he tried using, uh, tried searching for the word Innsbruck, and um, he said uh, he he wrote it with uh, two N and uh, a CK as just uh, as it's spelled uh, today, but it found also the the earlier um, writing style with one N and missing a C, and but it looks um, alike enough. So if you have a word where an M or just one letter is missing, it it will look alike uh, like uh, the word with an M if it's long enough or something like, like that. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Next up is Carolina. Carolina Lemke and Paul Onish. Caroline will present herself. She works for the Barlach and Barlach edition. This is one of the first editions that use the HDR from Rostock also due to the proximity in space. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Hi. Um, yes, uh, Paul Onash and me are uh, presenting or representing the Ballard 2020 edition. It's a um, project of the printed edition of the letters written by Ernst Ballach. And we are cooperating with several Ballach institutions and with Sidlev from Rostock, as you heard. Um, Ernst Balach uh, was, an attributed, was attributed to be an expressionist. He had approximately 400 different partners of correspondence, and as Balach was stating in this quote to Lucy Müller van den Broek, he was quite fond of writing, since he basically was writing every day. Nevertheless, he was quite fond of having a hot punch or a smoke too. So these are our cooperating partners, and more interesting is who was Ernst Balach. So he was a doctor's son born on the 2nd of January 1870 in Wedel near Hamburg. He was an acclaimed sculptor, printmaker and writer and died on 24th of October in 1938 in Rostock. Balach became famous for his sculptures of the so-called simple people, such as beggars, farmers or old people, and it, uh, as well as for his memorials against the war. For example, as you can see here, the war memorial of Magdeburg from 1928-29. With the political uprising uh, of the Nazis, his aesthetics of arts uh, were classified <coughs> as a degenerated art by the new government. And as a consequence of this label, every war memorial by Abalach was dismantled by the Nazis between 1934 19, and 1938. Starting our work on the Transcription of Balach letters, we plan to generate transcripts with two independent editors. Based on the first edition of Balach's letters by Friedrich Dross, the published correspondence with Reinhard Pieper from 1998, and the love letters to Marga Böhmer, a publication from 2012. 
Those publications cover approximately 1,700 of the now known 2,100 Balach letters. They basically work as a control unit for us while we are generating transcripts from the original handwritings. Since the first edition from 1968-69, almost 400 new unpublished letters were discovered. Transcribus is now generating a transcript of those letters, which we are proofreading in a second step. When we are applying transcribus for generating transcripts, we are using the algorithm-based handwriting recognition by SITLAB, developed by the University of Rostock. SITLAB is drawing on a dictionary, especially configured for us. It's based on the two volumes of the edition of Balas Letters by Friedrich Dross. After the automatic baseline recognition, one of our students is making the necessary corrections in case the baselines are too short or anything like this. Then she starts the transcript run and proofreads the text for any misinterpretations. As you can see here, for example, on the fourth line, Deinen freundlichen Brief, the program cannot read the E and is uh, putting in a C instead. Or in the sixth line, Schmeichelhafte, actually Balach was just writing Schmeichelhaft without an E, and the interpretation is that it cannot read the empty slot. We have train sets of rather small units, like 50 pages, for example, that are around 20 letters. In total, we have already processed 300 documents from the unknown letters, and yeah, we can say the character rate is clearly improving. As you can see here, it's decreasing, and uh, that's a good sign for us when we have to do the comparison of the transcripts. So while Transcribus is improving, Bala's handwriting still possesses some difficulties. As you can see here, these two letters are representing two people, but actually it's, it's Balach. So it's quite fun to read if, you don't know, if you're not familiar with the handwriting. Uh, the left picture is a young Balach, and he was quite fond of writing in very small, tight lines. <coughs> and the older Balach is much easier to read, so you will recognize him immediately if you find the letter in any archives of Germany. Yeah, it might look like two different persons, but actually Transcribus has problems to interpret the characters if it's just trained on the older, of the newer letters, the older handwritings. So further difficulties of Bayer's handwriting are the graphically incomplete representation of the letters. He seems to write as he speaks, and therefore, for example, a lot of German E's are missing in the end of the words. Transcribus also has a tough time recognizing the line breaks when Balach is starting a word in one line and finishing it in the next one, but the program frequently reads it for two separate words. Balach is also very fond of writing in several directions. As you can see on the image to the left, turning the page in a circle, one might find oneself reading a letter upside down. Um, this is actually corresponding with difficulties to recognize the text regions and baselines. It is a problem especially for purely computer-generated acquisition of larger text copia. <coughs> Advantages are we only have to use one editor to transcribe a letter. We can generate a large corpus with valid transcription with up to 2,100 letters, and we are able to independently define the truth, uh, the ground truth, why the program is designed to train itself with this information. And, of course, we have the possibility to prepare a digital edition which will be a likely follow-up to the Balach 2020 project. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Caroline. Yep. Questions? I just missed your last sentence. Uh, so you said the HDR is training itself. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we can... Yes, Bonam, is it? Can you say it like this? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yes, the idea is when you produce, when you transcribe something, you can change the status at the top to ground truth. And then you can train, you can um, say, train everything which is marked by ground truth. And then um, your transcription automatically um, emanates a new train. This is about the gene. So this is basically just in time. Retraining of the of the model. Yes, you have to do it by yourself. So we have okay. to put yeah, button. 
I have a question about vocabulary. What's your experience? Well, did you check it with using it with a dictionary and without dictionary? And what's the experience there? So what do you gain, what do you lose by using, using dictionaries? What do we get? Um, I think we started without the dictionary and halfway through we added the dictionary, but I actually don't know from the training results. Was there a big difference? I can't recall actually. Yes, a bit. A bit. It improves a bit. And uh, the problem of uh, hypercorrections, so that you, that if you let, I had, for example, an E where it was left out by, uh, by Barla, because this is, one of, this is one of the problems if you're dealing with early modern text, because there is no standardized vocabulary to use. So adding vocabulary there helps in one way, because some of the words will be um, recognized correctly, but a lot of the words will be uh, hypercorrect, mm -hmm. so that some like doubling of uh, M's as we had before, so it will just be normalized. Um, so but that means, you would say the advantage, it has some advantages with uh, documents from 10th, 20th century to use vocabularies. Or, or Kundra would say that. <laughs> or we, we, we need to, to ask Tobias Schwarz. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> He's the expert uh, about vocabularies. But I think we, we should keep the, the problem of vocabularies in, in mind because it's not like self-evident to, to use them. Okay, thanks a lot.